All right, so um, we're getting into the next part of Francis McComber now. We just heard the story of the lion, how Francis ran away like a scared rabbit, and um, pretty much how everybody saw. So let's pick it up. That was the story of the lion. McComber did not know how the lion had felt before he started his rush, nor during it. When the unbelievable smash of the 505 at the muzzle velocity of two tons had hit him in the mouth. Nor what kept him coming after that when the second ripping crash had smashed his hindquarters and he had come crawling on toward the crashing, blasting thing that had destroyed him. Wilson knew something about it and only expressed it by saying, Damn fine lion. But McComber did not know how Wilson felt about things either. He did not know how his wife felt except that she was through with him. His wife had been through with him before, but it never lasted. So this is what's keeping them together, ready? He was very wealthy and would be much wealthier, and he knew it, that she would not leave him now or ever. That was one of the few things he really knew. He knew about that, about motorcycles, that was earliest. About motor cars, about duck shooting, about fishing, trout, salmon, and big sea about sex and books, many books, too many books, about all court games, about dogs, not much about horses, about hanging on to his money, about most of the other things his world dealt in, and about his wife not leaving him. His wife had been a great beauty, and she was still a great beauty. But she was not a great enough beauty anymore to be able to leave him and better herself, and she knew it, and he knew it. She had missed the chance to leave him, and he knew it. If he had been better with women, she would probably have started to worry about him getting another new, beautiful wife. But she knew too much about him to worry about that either. Also, he always had a great tolerance, which seemed the nicest thing about him, if it were not the most sinister. So this last line here kind of goes to that idea of the Hemingway hero, somebody who is you know, very stoic and doesn't really show emotion. So this idea at the end that, um, you know, he was nice and that was kind of a sinister thing. Sinister is, you know, <laughs> means evil, basically. It's not a positive connotation. Um, so we're kind of painting Macomber, the seeming coward, as being almost like the anti-Hemingway hero, so to speak. All in all, they were known as comparatively happy married couple. So here, what we're going to get here is kind of a little bit of context for their marriage. They're wealthy Americans. They're the type of people who get written up about in gossip columns, etc. All in all, they were known as a comparatively happily married couple. One of those whose disruption is often rumored but never occurs. And as the society columnist put it, they were adding more than a spice of adventure to their much envied and ever enduring romance by a safari in what was known as Darkest Africa until the Martin Johnsons lighted it on so many silver screens where they were pursuing old Simba the Lion, the Buffalo, Tembo the Elephant, and as well collecting specimens for the Museum of Natural History. The same columnist had reported them on the verge at least three times in the past, and they had been, but they always made it up. They had a sound basis of union. Margot was too beautiful for Macomber to divorce, and Macomber had too much money for Margot to ever leave him. It was now about three o'clock in the morning, and Francis Macomber, who had been asleep a little while after he had stopped thinking about the lion, wakened and then slept again, woke suddenly, frightened in a dream of the bloody-headed lion standing over him and listening while his heart pounded. He realized that his wife was not in the other cot in the tent. He lay awake with that knowledge for two hours. So how about that? His wife is not in the tent. Only a few places she could be. And um, he has to deal with that. At the end of that time, his wife came into the tent, lifted her mosquito bar, and crawled cozily into bed. Where have you been? Macomber asked in the darkness. Hello, she said. Are you awake? Where have you been? I just went out to get a breath of air. You did like hell. What do you want me to say, darling? Where have you been? Out to get a breath of air. <laughs> That's a new name for it. You are a bitch. Well, you're a coward. All right, he said. What of it? Nothing as far as I'm concerned, but please let's not talk, darling, because I'm very sleepy. You think that I'll take anything. 
I know you will, sweet. Well, I won't. Please, darling, let's not talk. I'm so very sleepy. There wasn't going to be any of that. You promised there wouldn't be. Well, there is now, she said sweetly. You said if we made this trip that there would be none of that. You promised. Yes, darling. That's the way I meant it to be, but the trip was spoiled yesterday. We don't have to talk about it, do we? You don't wake long when you have an advantage, do you? Please, let's not talk. I'm so sleepy, darling. Well, I'm going to talk. Don't mind me, then, because I'm going to sleep. And she did. So, if you haven't picked up on it, she slept with Robert Wilson. And apparently, if we look here... Right? Um... Right, this whole kind of area here. This is obviously something she has done before. She has stepped out on Macomber in the past. Seems like she has might have been, even been making a habit of it. And then here, I think this is the most savage thing. He's like, well, I'm going to talk about it. And she says, well, I'm going to sleep. And she did this right here. She just doesn't care at all. And she sleeps like nothing is wrong and nothing happened. And now they all have to have breakfast together. What fun. At breakfast... They were all three at the table before daylight, and Francis McComber found that, of all the many men he had hated, he had hated Robert Wilson the most. Sleep well? Wilson asked in his throaty voice, filling a pipe. Did you? Topping, the white hunter told him. You bastard, thought McComber. You insolent bastard. So she woke him up when she came in, Wilson thought, looking at them both with his flat, cold eyes. Now, Wilson, for his part, and this is, I think, right here, a good example of it, is the classic Hemingway hero. Wilson thought, looking at them both with his flat, cold eyes. Well, why doesn't he keep his wife where she belongs? What does she think I am, a bloody plaster saint? Let him keep it where she belongs. It's his own fault. Do you think we'll find buffalo? Margot asked, pushing away a dish of apricots. Chance of it, Wilson said and smiled at her. Why don't you say in camp? Oh, not for anything, she told him. Why not order ought to have to stay in camp, Wilson said to Macomber. You order her, said Macomber coldly. Let's not have any ordering, nor turning to Macomber. Any silliness, Francis, Margot said quite pleasantly. Are you ready to start, Macomber asked. Any time, Wilson told him. Do you want the Mem Sahib to go? Does it make any difference whether I do or not? The hell with it, thought Robert Wilson. The had a complete hell with it. So, this is what it's going to be like? Well then, this is what it's going to be like. Makes no difference, he said. You sure you wouldn't like to stay in camp with her yourself and just let me go out and hunt the buffalo? Macomber asked. Can't do that, said Wilson. Wouldn't talk rot if I were you. I'm not talking rot, I'm disgusted. It's bad way, disgusted. Francis, will you please try to speak sensibly? His wife said. I speak too damn sensibly, Macomber said. Did you ever eat such filthy food? Something wrong with the food? asked Wilson quietly, no more than with anything else. Why pull yourself together, laddie book? Wilson said very quietly. He's a boy, waits at table, understands a little English. Yeah, well, the hell with him. Wilson stood up and, puffing on his pipe, strolled away, speaking a few words in Swahili to one of the gun bearers, who was standing, waiting for him. Macomber and his wife sat at the table. He was staring at his coffee cup. If you make a scene, I'll leave you, darling. Margot said quietly. No, you won't. You can try it and see. You won't leave me. No, she said. I won't leave you. And you'll behave yourself. Behave myself? That's a way to talk. Behave myself? Yes, behave yourself. Why don't you try behaving? I've tried so long. So very long. I hate that red-faced swine. Macomber said. I loathe the sight of him. He's really very nice. Oh, shut up. Macomber almost shouted. Just then, the car came up and stopped in front of the dining tent, and the driver and the two gun bearers got out. Wilson walked over and looked at the husband and wife, sitting there at the table. Going shooting? he asked. Yes, said Macomber, standing up. Yes. Better bring a woolly. It'll be cool in the car, Wilson said. I'll get my leather jacket, Margot said. The boy has it, Wilson told her. He climbed to the front with the driver, and Francis Macomber and his wife sat, not speaking in the back seat. Again, we see this. Remember before, Macomber was in the front seat, and now Wilson is. So we have kind of that switch. Small, but significant. Oh, I hope the silly beggar doesn't take a notion to blow the back of me head off, Wilson thought to himself. Eh, women are a nuisance on safari. 
The car was grinding down to cross the river at a pebbly, pebbly ford in the Great Dial. Let me start that again. The car was grinding down to cross the river at a pebbly ford in the gray daylight and then climbed angling up the steep bank where Wilson had ordered away shoveled out the day before so that they could reach the park-like wooded rolling country on the far side. It was a good morning, Wilson thought. There was a heavy dew and as the wheels went through the grass and low bushes he could smell the odor of the crushed fronds. It was an odor like verbena and he liked this early morning smell of dew. He crushed the crushed bracken and the look of the tree trunk showed black through the early morning mist as the car made its way through the untracked park-like country. He had put the two in the back seat out of his mind now and was thinking about buffalo. The buffalo that he was after stayed in the daytime in a thick swamp where it was impossible to get a shot. But in the night, they fed out into an open stretch of country. And if he could come between them and their swamp with the car, Macomber would have a good chance at them in the open. He did not want to hunt buff or anything else with Macomber at all, but he was a professional hunter and he had hunted with some rare ones in his time. If they got buff today, there would only be rhino to come and the poor man would have gone through his dangerous game and things might pick up. He'd have nothing more to do with the woman and Macomber would get over that too. He must have gone through plenty of that before by the look of things. Poor bigger. He must have a way of getting over it. Well, it's the poor sod's own bloody fault. So here, so this kind of idea here, Wilson being like, well, hey, you know, he doesn't want his wife sleeping with other men, then he should control his wife. Very classic Hemingway hero attitude. And uh, let's see in this next paragraph if Wilson fits any more of those characteristics. He, Robert Wilson, sorry, I got a sneeze coming on. He, Robert Wilson, carried a double-sized car on safari to accommodate any windfalls he might receive. He had hunted for a certain clientele, the international fast sporting set, where the women did not feel they were getting their money's worth unless they had shared that cot with the white hunter. He despised them when he was away from them, although he liked some of them well enough at the time, but he's made his living by them, and their standards were his as long as they were hiring him. So here, Wilson himself makes a hobbit of... Uh, sleeping with the wives of men who he takes on safari, and it's kind of a part of the job as far as he's concerned. They were his standards in all except the shooting. He had his own standards about the killing, and they could live up to them or they could get somebody else to hunt them. He knew, too, that they all respected him for this. This macomber was an odd one, though. Damned if he wasn't. Now the wife... Well, the wife, yes, the wife. <sighs> the wife. Well, he's dropped all that. He looked around at them. Macomber sat grim and furious. Margot smiled at him. She looked younger today, more innocent and fresher and not so profound, professionally beautiful. What's in her heart, God knows, Wilton thought. She hadn't talked much last night, and at it, and that, excuse me, at that, it was a pleasure to see her. The motor, cli the motor car climbed up a slight rise and went on through the trees, and then out into a grassy prairie-like opening that kept in the shelter of the trees along the edge the driver going slowly and Wilson looking carefully out across the prairie and all along its far side. He stopped the car and studied the opening with his field glasses, and then he motioned to the driver to go on, and the car moved slowly along. The driver, the driver avoiding warthog holes and driving around the mud castles ants had built, and then, looking across the opening, Wilson suddenly turned and said, By God, there they are! In looking where he pointed, while the car jumped forward, and Wilson spoke in rapid Swahili to the driver, Macomber saw three huge black animals looking almost cylindrical in their long heaviness, like big black tank cars, moving at a gallop across the far edge of the prairie. So we're about to see a shift in the way that Hemingway is writing. If um, we kind of see here, in all of these paragraphs, right, starting here and kind of going down... We have that classic Hemingway style of really kind of short declarative sentences. And um, we're about to see that shift into more fast paced writing to reflect the faster pace of the scene. So let's see what that looks like. We're going to start here. Looking where he pointed while the car jumped forward and Wilson spoke in rapid Swahili to the driver, Macomber saw three huge black animals looking almost cylindrical in their long heaviness, like big black tank cars moving at a gallop across the far edge of the open prairie. They moved at a stiff-necked, stiff-bodied gallop, and he could see the upswept, wide black horns on their heads as they galloped, heads out, the heads not moving. They are three old bulls, Wilson said. We'll cut them off before they get to the swamp. Here we go. Ready? 
The car was going a wild 45 miles an hour across the open, and as Macomber watched, the buffalo got bigger and bigger until he could see the gray, hairless, scabby look of one huge bull, and now his neck was a part of his shoulders and the shiny black of his horns as he galloped a little behind the others that were strung out in that steady plunging gait, and then the car swaying as though it had just jumped a road. They drew up close and he could see the plunging hugeness of the bull and the dust in his sparsely haired hide, the wide boss of horn and his outstretched wide nostriled muzzle, and he was raising his rifle when Wilson shouted, Not from the car, you fool! And he had no fear. Ooh, how about that? Only hatred of Wilson while the brakes clamped on the car, and the car skidded, plowing sideways to an almost stop, and Wilson was out on one side, and he on the other, stumbling as his feet hit the still speeding by of the earth, and then he was shooting at the bull, and he moved away, hearing the bullets wunk into him, emptying his rifle as he moved steadily away, finally remembering to get his shots forward into the shoulder, and he fumbled to reload, and then he saw the bull was down. Down on his knees, his big head tossing, and seeing the other two still galloping, he shot at the leader and hit him. He shot again and missed, and he heard the Kerouang roar as Wilson shot, and saw the leading bull slide forward onto his nose. Get that out! Other, Wilson said. Now you're shooting. But the other bull was moving steadily at the same gallop, as he, and he missed, throwing a spurt of dirt. And Wilson missed, and the dust rose in a cloud, and Wilson shouted, Come on, he's too far! And grabbed his arm, and they were in the car again, Macomber and Wilson, hanging on the sides and rocking swayingly over the uneven ground, drawing up in the steady, plunging, heavy neck, straight-moving, galloping a bull. They were behind him, and Macomber was filling his rifle, dropping the shells on the ground, jamming it, clearing the jam. They were almost upon the bull when Wilson, Wilson yelled, Stop! And the car skidded so that it almost swung over, and Macomber fell forward as he aimed into the galloping round black back, aimed and shot again, then again, then again, and the bullets, all of them hitting, had no effect on the buffalo that he could see, and then Wilson shot, the roar deafening him, and he could see the bull stagger, but Comber shot again, aiming carefully, and down he came onto his knees. All right, said Wilson, nice work, that's the three. So we could see in this whole area, right, this paragraph all the way down to here, much different um, sentence structure. If we look at this paragraph... You can see the sentences are much, much, much longer, right? Even up here, I think if we look this whole first bit all the way, keep going, all of this, one big sentence. Right? Much different structure, kind of reflecting, again, the pace of the scene. So we can see how writers here in this kind of example, if we look at the difference between here and here, how Hemingway uses his structure to either uh, speed up or slow down the pace of the story. We're going to start here. Macomber felt a drunken elation. How many times did you shoot? He asked. Just three, Wilson said. You killed the fast bull, the biggest one. I helped you finish the other two. Afraid they make it into cover. You had him killed. I was just mopping up a little. You shot damn well. Let's go to the car, said Macomber. I want a drink. Got to finish off that buff first, Wilson told him. The buffalo was on his knees, and he jerked his head furiously and bellowed in pig-eyed, roaring rage as they came toward him. Watch that he doesn't get up, Wilson said. Then, get a little broadside. Take him in the nick, just behind the ear. Macomber aimed carefully at the center of the huge, jerking, rage-driven neck and shot. At that shot, the head dropped forward. That does it, said Wilson. Got the spine. For a hell of a fine-looking thing, aren't they? Let's get that drink, said Macomber. In his life, he had never felt so good. Now that he's proven himself to be a brave man, suddenly he feels so good and empowered, right? Hemingway hero. In the car, Macomber's wife sat very white-faced. She is not happy. You were marvelous, darling, she said to Macomber. What a ride. Was it rough? Wilson asked. It was frightful. I had never been more frightened in my life. Let's all have a drink, Macomber said. By all means, said Wilson. Give it to the Sahib. She drank the neat whiskey from the flask and shuddered a little when she swallowed. She handed the flask to Macomber, who handed it to Wilson. It was frightfully exciting, she said. It's given me a dreadful headache. I didn't know you were allowed to shoot at them from the cars, though. See here, she's trying to kind of take away from what they did. No one shot from the cars, said Wilson coldly. I mean, chase them from cars. Wouldn't ordinarily, said Wilson. Seems sporting enough to me, though, while we were doing it, and taking more chance driving that way across the plain full of holes in one thing or another than hunting on foot. Buffalo could have charged us each time we shot if they liked. Gave them every chance. Wouldn't mention it to anyone, though. It's illegal, if that's what you meant. 
Well, it seemed very unfair to me, Margot said, chasing those big helpless things in a motor car. Did it, said Wilson. What would happen if they heard about it in Nairobi? Remember what Wilson said earlier, how she doesn't wait long when she has an advantage? That's proof. Well, I'd lose me license, for one thing, other unpleasantnesses. Wilson said, taking a drink from the flask, I'd be out of business. Really? Well, said Macomber, and he smiled for the first time all day. Now she has something on you. You have such a pretty way of putting things, Francis, Margot Macomber said. Wilson looked at them both. If a four-letter man marries a five-letter woman, he was thinking, what number of letters would their children be? What he said was, we lost a gun bearer. Did you notice it? Oh, my God, no, Macomber said. Eh, here he comes, Wilson said. He's all right, must have fallen off when we left the fast bull. Approaching them was the middle-aged gun bearer, limping along in his knitted cap, khaki tunic, shorts and rubber sandals, gloomy-faced and disgusted-looking. As he came up, he called out to Wilson in Swahili, and they all saw the change in the white hunter's face. What does he say? asked Margot. He says the fast bull got up and went into the bush. Wilson said with no expression in his voice. Now, this is the first, uh, the same thing that happened with the lion, right? So, we're kind of getting set up for a replay of yesterday. Oh, said Macomber blankly. <gasps> then it's going to be just like the lion, said Macomber, said Margo, full of anticipation. It's not going to be a damn beat thing like the lion, Wilson told her. Did you want another drink, Macomber? Yes, thanks, Macomber said. He expected the feeling he had had about the lion to come back, but it did not. For the first time in his life, he felt really holy without fear. Instead of fear, he had a definite feeling of elation. We'll go and have a look at the second bull, Wilson said. Tell the driver to put the car in the shade. What are you going to do? asked Margaret Macomber. Take a look at the buff, Wilson said. I'll come. Come along. The three of them walked over to where the second buffalo bulked blackly in the open, head forward on the grass. The massive horn swung wide. It's a very good head, Wilson said. It's close to a 50-inch spread. Macomber was looking at him with delight. He's hateful looking, said Margot. Can't we go in the shade? Of course, Wilson said. Look, he said to Macomber and he pointed. See that patch of bush? Yes. That's where the first bull went in. The gun bearer said when he fell off, the bull was down. He was watching us helling along and the other two buff galloping. And when he looked up, there was the bull looking at him. Gunbearer ran like hell, and the bull went off slowly into the bush. Interesting here how the gunbearer ran, just like Macomber did yesterday, but nobody seems to notice. Fine. Uh, can we go in after him now? Asked Macomber eagerly. So when he was faced with the same situation yesterday, he didn't want to go after the lion. Now that he's found his his uh, his manliness, his, his fearlessness, he chomping at the bit to go after him. Wilson looked at him appraisingly. Damn, did this season a strange one, he thought. Yesterday, he scared Zeke. And today, he's a ruddy fire eater. Nah, we'll give him a, give him a while. Let's just please go into the shade, Margot said. Her face was white and she looked ill. They made their way to the car where it stood under a single wide spreading tree and they all climbed in. Chances are he's dead in there, Wilson remarked. After a little while, have a look. Macomber felt a wild, unreasonable happiness that he had never known before. By God, that was a chase, he said. I've never felt any such feeling. Wasn't it marvelous, Margot? I hated it. Why? I hated it, she said bitterly. I loathed it. You know, I don't think I'd ever be afraid of anything ever again. Uh-oh, Margot does not like that. Macomber said to Wilson, Something happened to me after we saw the first buff and started after him. Like a dam bursting. It was pure excitement. Cleans out your liver, said Wilson. Damn funny things happen to people. Macomber's face was shining. You know, something did happen to me, he said. I feel absolutely different. His wife said nothing and eyed him strangely. She was sitting far back in the seat, and Macomber was sitting forward, talking to Wilson, who turned sideways, talking over the back of the front seat. You know, I'd like to try another lion, Macomber said. I'm really not afraid of them now. After all, what can they do to you? That's it, said Wilson. Last one thing can do is kill ya. How does it go? Shakespeare, damn good. See if I can remember. It was damn good. Used to quote it to myself at one time. Let's see. By my troth, I cannot. A man can die but once. We owe God a death and let it go which way it will. He that dies this year is quit for the next. 
damn fine, oh? He was very embarrassed, having brought this thing out that he had lived by. But he had seen men come of age before, and it always moved him. It was not a matter of their 21st birthday. So we can see here, Wilson does indeed have kind of like feelings and emotions, even though he is that classic Hemingway hero. And here he's embarrassed that he kind of showed something personal about himself, because it is very anti what he's all about. But it's almost like he saw Macomber become a man that day, and it was moving to him. So he says, what does this button do? Oh, hey, I can point to things. That's a new update. Okay, fun. He had taken a strange chance of hunting, a sudden precipitation into action without opportunity, for worrying beforehand to bring this about with Macomber. But regardless of how it had happened, it had most certainly happened. Look at the big now, Wilson thought. It's that some of them stay little boys so long, Wilson thought. Sometimes all their lives. Their figures stay boyish when they're 50. The great American boymen. Damn strange people. But he likes this macabre now. Damn strange fellow. Probably meant the end of cuckoldry too. Well, that would be a damn good thing. Damn good thing. Beg had probably been afraid all his life. Don't know what started it, but it's over now. Hadn't had time to be afraid with the buff. That and being angry too. Motor car too. Motor cars made it familiar. Be a damn fire eater now. He'd seen it in the war work the same way. More of a change than any loss of virginity. Fear, gone like an operation. Something else grew in its place. It's the main thing a man had. It made him into a man. And women knew it too. No bloody fear. From the far corner of the seat, Margaret McComber looked at the two of them. There was no change in Wilson. She saw Wilson as she had seen him the day before, when she had first realized what a great talent was. But she saw the change in Francis Macomber now. Do you have the feeling of happiness about what's going to happen? Macomber said, still exploring his new wealth. You're not supposed to mention it, Wilson said, looking in the other's face. Much more fashionable to say you're scared. Mind you, you'll be scared too, plenty of times. But you have a feeling of happiness about action to come. Yeah, said Wilson. Here's that. Doesn't do talk too much about this. Talk the whole thing away. No pleasure in anything if you mouth it up too much. You're both talking rot, said Margot. Just because you've chased some helpless animals in a motor car, you talk like heroes. Sorry, said Wilson. Oh, I've been gassing too much. She's worried about it already, he thought. If you don't If you don't know what you're talking about, why not keep out of it? Macomber said to his wife. Whoa he's really pushing back on her now. You've gotten awfully brave awfully suddenly, his wife said contemptuously. But her contempt was not secure. She was very afraid of something. Hmm, what is she afraid of, do you think? Probably that he's become fearless. <laughs> Macomber laughed a very natural laugh. You know I have, he said. I really have. Isn't it sort of late? Mar Margot said bitterly. Because she had done the best she could for many years back, and the way they were together now was no one person's fault. Not for me, said Macomber. Margot said nothing but sat back in the corner of the seat. Do you think we'd given him enough time? Macomber asked Wilson cheerfully. We might have a look, Wilson said. You have any solids left? The gun bearer has some. Wilson called in Swahili to the old gun bearer, who was skinning out one of the heads. Straightening up, he pulled a box of solids out of his back pocket and brought them over to Macomber, who filled his magazine and put the remaining shells in his pocket. What's my time here? Oh, no, 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 no. What are we looking at? Right, we're going to actually wrap it up here. Um, put it in his pocket. So we're going to stop here. And tomorrow will be our, or next class rather, will be our final installment in the short happy life of Francis McComber. How will it end up? What will become of them all? Find out next time in the exciting conclusion. All right, kiddos. Hope you're doing good.